What I'm going to have here, thank you to everybody for setting up the website, and thank you for inviting me here, is random unpleasant pictures of various things that are tra tangentially related to this talk, ranging in period from about 1300 to about 1700. So they're not historically specific or specifically specific, but um, I kind of figured in these days you're meant to have slides. <laughs> and my slides would, would just be words. So you've got pictures. So here we go. This is being edible in early modern England. Hamlet's thoughts about the human, like those of so many in the early modern period, frequently take the animal as the other. Whether he's extolling humanity's powers or challenging them, they are there to clarify, but all too often serve also to undermine human superiority. Famously, he states, what piece of work is a man? How noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving. How express and admirable in, in, in action. How like an angel in apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. In this moment, even while announcing his own species as the greatest of God's creation, Hamlet recognises man as the paragon, the highest among the animals. Not entirely set apart, but best. Earlier, this refusal to separate human from animal had taken on a negative meaning. In the face of his widowed mother's swift remarriage, Hamlet cries, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer. Gertrude's failure is both inhuman, it marks her as not using the reason that humans are endowed with, and it is unnatural. It goes against natural, that is, untaught actions that animals would fulfil. This sense of the complex link between humans and animals there from the beginning in Judeo-Christian culture. At the end of the sixth day of creation, just before retiring to rest, God told Adam that, quote, every herb-bearing seed which is upon all the earth and every tree wherein is the fruit of the tree-bearing seed, that shall be to you for meat, unquote. This vegan directive found in the text was the foundation of, that was the foundation of thinking about human status in the early modern period, as before and as after, was also given to animals. Likewise, God says, to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the heaven and to everything that moveth upon the earth which hath life in itself, every green herb shall be for meat, and it was so. Laurie Shannon has proposed that what she terms Genesis's first charter fashions plants and, as commodity-like consumable things. Animals for her are placed differently. They are, she says, in a political relation with, animal, with humans as the herb-entitled subjects of human rule. From this perspective, the original distinction of man from beast was there, but it was a distinction in which a connection persisted. The flood was God's response to human sinfulness and it not only destroyed all that humans had built, it also brought about a change in dietary directive from the Almighty. In Genesis 9, on finding land, after the waters have subsided, Noah is told, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the heaven, upon all that moveth on the earth and upon the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Everything that moveth and liveth shall be meat for you. As the green herb have I given you all things. The consumption of animals was thus understood to be part of humanity's full and proper engagement with God's creation after this moment. It followed a divine directive. In the poet George Herbert's vision of this providential universe, the beasts, he writes, say, eat me. These animals know humans have dominion, and they agree, apparently enthusiastically, that it is their role to be consumed. However, the timing of the introduction of meat-eating after the flood also meant that it marked humanity's slide from perfection. And as such, it revealed our corruption as much as our dominion. It's wholly appropriate, then, in response to such a paradox that the making commodity of animals does not serve to simply reinforce human superiority. Far from it, the commodification of beasts is both produced by and a reflection of human failure. This ambiguity in human-animal relations can be traced in many different ways in early modern culture, sometimes with negative connotations and sometimes with positive. To start with a negative, 
as well as marking human failure because it's post-lapsarian as an addition to our diet and therefore is a reflection of our sinfulness, writers of dietetic manuals from the early modern period argued that meat had the capacity to act on the eater in ways that brought to the fore not so much human dominance with the assumption of power over, of eater over eaten as humanity's interconnectedness with the creatures they consumed. As the historian of food Ken Albala has shown, those substances he writes most similar to the human body were believed to be the most easily assimilated and thus the most nutritious by early modern authors. And so, inevitably, the idea of eating human flesh was, he says, a perennial obsession for dietary writers as human flesh was, within the logic of this system, the most nutritious meat available. Cannibalism was, of course, um, regarded as deeply unnatural and irreligious. And so to simultaneously avoid anthropophagy and to maintain a healthy diet, animal flesh was eaten, um, which of course then underlines the closeness of human and animal flesh. Uh, as James Hart stated in 1633, pigs were believed to have what he called a great likeness and resemblance to man's flesh. And this made them, as Albala puts it, the next best thing to human flesh by universal assent. As such, dietetic advice was not only bad for pigs, but it also posited a paradoxical close connection between them and humans. And the only reason that you know that a pig's flesh is like a human's flesh is because you've <laughs> tried both. Um, I would say, that, I'm sorry, it's just me making a suggestion there. Okay. Taking the interconnectedness of humans and animals in discussions of consumption in a different direction, in her reading of Hamlet, Karen Raber thinks about humans as themselves consumable beings. The existence of parasitic creatures like tapeworms that lived within and so fed upon humans leads her to contemplate what she calls mutual cannibalism. While humans eat meat and so display their power, at the same time, as the dietetic and medical texts of the period remind us, they physically house, this is a quote from Raber, creation in the form of maggots and worms. This leads Raber to ask, do we become indistinguishable from the vermin we house? Are we merely common vermin as well? To add to this conundrum, the very existence of parasitic worms raised theological problems for the period. If God created all animals on the fifth day and man on the sixth, was man created with a worm already inside him? I love these questions. <laughs> Ian McInnes has pondered this. He says, on the one hand, the tapeworm being a creature of corruption should emblematize the mortal taste of the fruit. Adam's worm is Adam's choice writ within, he says. On the other hand, since worms and other invertebrates are a natural part of the created world, they might, like the serpent, which was often classed with invertebrates, be innocent victims of Adam's choice. From every angle, it seems, animal flesh upsets humans' exceptional status. But while the meaning of meat eating was so paradoxical, paradoxical, an act of human dominion over non-humans that marked human failure and could undermine human status. In another context, the commodification of animals that often led directly to the production of meat was felt to have the potential to breed a positive sense of interspecies community. For example, in the third sermon of his 1609 text, The Householder, the clergyman Edward Topsell cited Proverbs 12.10, a righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. And he reminded his readers that their household includes animals and that what he called the perfect man must, quote, provide hay and grass for cattle. He also noted that, quote, our flocks and herds are our families. Our cattle are charges pastoral and magisterial, kingdoms to kings, monarchies to emperors. Now, while the latter statement brings in the analogical potential of dominion over animals in that it symbolizes a kind of rule of monarch over human subject, underpinning Topsell's words is another conception of a connection between humans and their quick cattle, that is their living property, that we should, I think, take seriously. Indeed, in a chapter called Animal Families, Helen Smith has shown how in Topsell's and others' writings, the animal, the household and civil life were tightly interlinked. She cites Robert Cleaver's 1598 declaration that a householder should have a Christian 
care over his animals and argues that such a declaration blurs, quote, the line between rational contractual man and dumb and insensible beast. So amid such discussions of both the negative and the positive entanglements of humans and animals in early modern thought, there remained, however, a crucial difference, a difference that underpinned all relations between the species, even more than the communitarian ones. In his exposition of the symbol of 1595, the leading English Calvinist of the age, William Perkins, put it in these terms. Some creatures made before man were only bodily as beasts, fishes, fowl. Some spiritual as angels. Now man is both spiritual in regard of his soul, corporal and sensible in regard of his body. There is as such an essential God-given difference between man and beast and the human's possession of a immortal soul or a spiritual soul as he calls it, was believed to have practical implications in the terrestrial realm too it gave them the capacity to reason. On the one hand, animals' wholly mortal state meant that they lacked reason or lacked human reason, which was the only reason that mattered, and were therefore killable in a way that humans or those being classed as human could not be. As such, the claim for human immortality, our possession of a soul, was inherently linked to human dominion, our rule over the natural world and was manifested in caring for animals as much as in eating them. So for this reason, discussions of human immortality can be found in areas of early modern culture beyond sermons and works of theology. To offer one example, and this is an example I keep on using, I feel like I should find another one, but it just works really well. Um, in the same year as uh, Edward Topsell's Householder was written, Nicholas Morgan wrote a horse training manual that begins with this. He says that the creation of man was distinct from that of animals because God, this is a horse training manual, God having created all other creatures with bodies and faculties of life together, yet to make the excellency and dignity of the creation of man greater, he fashioned the body of man only apart to plant therein the soul by inspiration, showing that the soul that he inspired in the body of man is not taken of the earth, or of the elef elements, elephants, to die as the body doth. But in his creation, he breathed in his face the breath of life, whereby man was made a living soul. All other creatures were subject to corruption and man to a perpetuity of felicity to eternal life. From this perspective, in this horse training manual, immortality places humans above animals in the Christian hierarchy and makes us capable of training, taming, controlling nature. Indeed, performing such acts of domination becomes a human duty, a fulfilling of the responsibility handed down to us by the Almighty. However, moving straight from thinking about life, eating and reading, to contemplating the afterlife, our species' essential immortality, when focusing on human status in early modern ideas is, I think, to miss a moment of what might be termed a fleshy overlap. Because a challenge to any distinctions established between binaries, human, animal, immortal, mortal, and so on, can be found when our gaze is focused not on the rationally organized life or on the eternal soul of the human, but on the body. And it is in this context, I suggest, that Hamlet can be read. What Hamlet draws attention to is not so much the capacity of the human to be a host to parasites, as Raber argues, although of course he does say that, or that the human is always destined to be food for worms, which of course he also says. I want to argue here that the play challenges us to think about our distinction from animals in ways that counter Morgan's claim that, humans, that the human was made a living soul while all other creatures were subject to corruption. From the orthodox Christian perspective voiced by Morgan, human domin dominion is the crucial marker of our special status. However, because in the consumption of the human by worms and our other lower creatures, humans cease to be the possessors of dominion and therefore our post-mortem humanity 
is understood within this orthodox perspective to exist not in the edible body, but beyond in the realm of the beyond the realm of the physical in the soul. Without the life force, the body simply becomes a kind of terrestrial residue. And so when the body when that body is eaten, when it rots, what is eaten and rotting is not human. As what is human has already departed into the afterlife. Can everybody see how that is working? As such, the conception of our species as exceptional in our immortality, whether we are saved or damned, reinforces the sense of human difference in the flesh as well as in the spirit. We are always potential immortal essences. <laughs> Hamlet, the play, I think does something else. <coughs> it does, of course, offer the reassurance of immortality when Horatio calls on flights of angels to sing Hamlet to his rest and so on. But what we also encounter is the idea that the staging of that reassurance is what I think is a kind of calculated forgetting. And I'm taking that idea from Jacques Derrida. And he writes that the um, idea of an animal as a being with a capacity for a response and not just a reaction, is, and this is a quote, something that philosophy perhaps forgets, perhaps being this calculated forgetting itself. I take that to suggest that there have been calculations, willed choices about the nature of animals that were taken up by philosophical thought and in time became the unthought, the naturalised um, orthodoxy. I wonder if in rereading Hamlet with a focus on flesh, might offer, we might find our way to remembering an earlier moment when assumptions about human selfhood and human exceptionalism were being thought differently. So there's a kind of moment of forgetting that makes us think that we are the immortal thing rather than the body that corrupts. And that's what's interesting to me here. Hamlet. I think, persistently reminds its audience that, that we are flesh. That is, alongside voicing a faith in human immortality, it reveals that our uh, belief in our utter difference from animals is something that we have had to work at. In his book Shakespeare in Ecology from 2015, Randall Martin argues that, quote, worms enable Hamlet to re-theorise human mortality as a transitional state a stage of ongoing ecological interdependency rather than physical closure, unquote. For Martin, like for me, there is something other than immortality after death for humans, but he focuses on Hamlet's acknowledgement of what he terms bi the biological metadrama of decay, of consumption and growth, and the way in which that allows Hamlet to see from the viewpoint of worms, as he puts it, that the relationship between life and death is, he says, not ethically fraught, that all physical matter passes through the bodies of worms to be reborn in new biodynamic relationships." Unquote. And Martin offers as a key illustration of this proto-Darwinian perspective in the play, Hamlet's, quote, physical interactions with Polonius's body, unquote, in Act Four. These interactions, Martin argues, prompt him to look downward and take upon him the mystery of things from below. In Eco-Criticism in Early Modern Literature from 2011, the same moment in the play leads Todd Borlick to write of, quote, Hamlet's morbid ecology, which he argues is also, this is a quote, very much aligned with eco-criticism and its rebuke to anthropocentric assumptions promoted by Christian theology. So for both of these writers, Hamlet is best read as a text that looks forward that preempts current environmental thinking, whether ecological or eco-critical. My reading points in the opposite direction. It sees Hamlet as recognizing Hamlet the play, sorry, recognizing past ideas, while also working in the present to construct a reassuring future. But in staging the comfort to come, it reminds us that if there is another way of thinking. Like Martin and Borlick, I also think Hamlet's encounter with death in Act Four is a moment of significance in the play, and that it offers a crucial exposition of the play's conception of humans, animals, and the simultaneous and sometimes paradoxical connections and distinctions between them. 
but I read it in a different way from them. When Martin writes of Polonius's body and Borlick of Polonius's corpse, I am writing about Polonius. So after, king, the king, after Hamlet's killed Polonius and has hidden his body, members of the court are searching for it. And we get this exchange, Claudius. Now Hamlet, where's Polonius? Hamlet, at supper. Claudius, at supper, where? Hamlet, not where he eats, but where he is eaten. The soul, the immortal marker of human distinction has gone, but Polonius remains Polonius. He remains a he when he is eaten in that his body remains him. He does not become an it, a different emptied thing. At this moment for Hamlet being a human being, Polonius persists physically after death. Or perhaps we should say that Polonius being dead is part of an understanding of Polonius being alive. Humans here are always rotting corpses, always inevitable food for worms. And that is who they are, not what happens to their bodies. The emphasis on human flesh and its edibility was a convention in medieval thought, as Carl Steele has shown. It persisted in early modern ideas, despite the seismic shift in religious belief in the 16th century. And Shakespeare's engagement with the idea in Hamlet represents perhaps a logical conclusion of what were a set of cultural commonplaces. And we can return to William Perkins to find a telling illustration of the ideas that underpin Shakespeare's thinking. His 1591 foundation of Christian religion is written as a catechism, that is, in question and answer form. And it goes like this, or one part of it goes like this. Question, let us now come to ourselves and first tell me, what is the natural estate of man? Answer, every man is by nature dead in sin as a loathsome carrion, or as a dead corpse lieth rotting and stinking in the grave, having in him the seeds of all sins. I love William Perkins, <laughs> just fantastic stuff. So this is, of course, simile, as a loathsome carrion, as a dead corpse, but its very carnal nature makes that simile feel like the dominant reality of the response. And this is a catechism. So this response was written to be learnt, as Perkins put it, without book, and in some measure felt in the heart. It was to be embedded in the self. It could, of course, be argued that if this conception of the human as loathsome carrion was familiar, then it might have become a dead metaphor rather than a living understanding or an understanding of living. But another example from Perkins shows that he, for one, did not think that that was the case. In his 1595 Salve for a Sick Man, he makes clear his belief that this was not, this was, oh, sorry, he makes clear that his belief that the simile of his catechism was the horrifying primary understanding for many, an understanding that was very difficult to displace. Proposing the idea that death is more excellent than life, Perkins writes, quote, it may be here the mind of man unsatisfied will yet further reply and say that howsoever in death the souls of men enter into heaven, Yet their bodies, though they have been tenderly kept for meat, drink and apparel, and have slept many a night in beds of down, must lie in dark and loathsome graves, and there be wasted and consumed with worms. Answer, so all this is true indeed, but all is nothing. If so be it, we will but consider a right of our graves as we ought. We must not judge of our graves as they appear to the bodily eye, but we must look upon them by the eye of faith. For Perkins then, even though the focus on the physical conception of the grave is the wrong one for a good Christian, because all Christians are fallen, all are most likely to judge first with what he calls a bodily eye. And so to dwell on this earthly place of corporeal decay and consumption, rather than on an incorporeal ever after. Such is our nature. We must learn, he says, to look beyond the physical and use what he calls the eye of faith, to focus on the inorganic, spiritual being that is also part of us. 
Thus, the early modern vision of human fleshiness is, for Perkins, very much at the forefront of human understanding and is very different from the idea of human embodiedness, which we are more familiar with in current anti-humanist and post-humanist engagements with human-animal relations. To offer just one example, when Anna Pick advocates a focus on, quote, the corporeal reality of living bodies, unquote, her examination of vulnerability calls up positive conceptions of species, weakness and mutuality. In distinction, the early modern vision of nau is of a nauseating meatiness, a being acknowledged by Hamlet in his description of Poli Polonius being eaten. Now, when critics have recognised eating and rotting flesh in Hamlet, they have mostly used it to point to other than fleshy issues. And this is just taking random essays. John Hunt has seen the emblematic value of human flesh, writing that its potential to decay reveals that the, quote, body, personal and politic is a provisional structure. Richard Fly likewise reads for political ideas when he links the idea that a rank, quote, corruption infects all social spheres in the kingdom, with the grave diggers complaint that we have many pocky corpses that will scarce hold the lying in. Even when readings of Hamlet do not make analogy their focus, flesh seems to disappear. So Robert N. Watson argues that in the play, quote, it is not merely the dread of something after death that robs enterprises of pitch and moment, of the name of action. The dread of nothing after death can have a similar effect. The play, of course, makes clear that there is something, however, bad after death. The ghosts coming from purgatory is evidence of that. But the play also thinks of after death as having a meaning in that it is also, it also shows that there is always something that happens to the human as to the animal after death. When we recognise as Hamlet, the character so clearly does, it's fleshiness. Likewise, in his study of the connections between the theatre and the scaffold and the animal and the animal baiting arena in what he terms Shakespeare's explorations into the nature and workings of humanness as psychological, ethical and political category, Andreas Herfler mar marginalises questions of human and animal flesh, even while arguing that, quote, flesh is the obsessive focus of Hamlet's thinking, as within pages he looks at something else completely, writing of humans as, quote, dust. Noting that, quote, the earth disgorges skulls and bones in the graveyard scene. So once again, we have a critical text that kind of erases the rotting flesh, in that instance, to get not to dust, but to bones themselves. Polonius's death is central to all of those readings that recognise the play's obsession with flesh and decay, and yet Hamlet's continuing to view Polonius as he, after his demise, is made invisible. The readings think instead about Polonius's body, it, and not about the implications of the persistence of Polonius as Polonius once his spiritual essence has departed. Such readings therefore push to the side an aspect of the human that places us not only among the animals, but also, worse even than that, as food for them. They collude, you might say, with the, orthodox, with the orthodox Christian idea that the human ceases to be a terrestrial being once breathing stops and are, as such, doing the important work of calculated forgetting that Derrida warned us about. For though writing in the secular field of literary criticism, these critics have, like William Perkins, asked us to take on faith that humans are special, that we are the ones who die rational inorganic deaths, that Polonius' corpse is not Polonius, that we are not animals. Hamlet, of course, is stuffed full of metaphorical human edibility that would seem to offer good evidence as to why the reality of our edibility should not be the focus of our interpretations. And you can just go through the pay. Marcellus and Barnardo are distilled almost to jelly. Uh, Hamlet talks about Pyrrhus baked and impasted, put in a pastry, roasted in wrath and fire, and so on and so on. I won't keep reading them through to you. As such, the critics who absent the reality of human edibility are working within the rules that the play sets up. But the metaphorical use of ideas of eating and being edible ceases at some moments. I've already discussed 
how Hamlet's statement that Polonius is being eaten in Act 4, Scene 3 focuses on the terrestrial continuity of the old man after his death, rather than on his post-mortem persistence as only an immortal soul. And this presence of the human flesh is the focus once again at the start of the final act, when Hamlet draws our attention to the inevitable rottenness in the graveyard, when he has a very close encounter with some of what Perkins had called loathsome carrion. Todd Borlick says of the graveyard scene that in it Hamlet arrives at, quote, a stoic acceptance of carnality. That is, he has by this time re rejected a fantasy of transcendent subjectivity. I suggest that something very different happens in this scene. Contemplating Yorick's soul, Hamlet, Hamlet ponders. Prithee Horatio, Horatio, tell me one thing, Horatio, what's that, my lord? Dost thou think Alexander looked of this fashion in the earth? E'en so. And smelt so? Pa! E'en so, my lord. David Hillman writes that Hamlet's, quote, reactions to the body parts strewn about him are strongly visceral, as the play says, his gorge rises at it, unquote. I likewise see the pa as an acknowledgement not only of the unavoidable presence of humanity's stinking, fleshy persistence, but also as a mark of the olfactory distress the material world causes Hamlet. And as such, this is a moment that he can, be, uh, that he can hardly be called stoical in. Indeed, the nauseating rot that is now Yorick, or that Yorick is now, and Jonathan, you can tell me the difference between those two things, because I'm really interested in that, um, leads Hamlet to a moment of forgetting. Rather than dwelling on the stinking carcasses, he, like so many critics of the play later, offers an analysis that absents the flesh, even while persisting with his morbid ecology. He narrates Alexander the Great's journey as being from life to death, to burial, to dust, to earth, to loam, and ultimately to that loam's role as, quote, stopping a bunghole in a beer barrel. As such, at this moment, Hamlet makes his and our, therefore, focus not Alexander's edible, stinking fleshiness, but another residue of humanity. The Arden edition of the play defines loam as, quote, clay moistened to make plaster. And so in becoming loam, Alexander is made dust alone. This shift from flesh to dust illustrates what Susan Zimmerman calls Hamlet's, quote, preoccupation with the indistinguishable skulls in the graveyard scene, which she argues, quote, served to deflect a still more horrifying recognition of their prior process of decomposition. Citing George Bataille's ideas, she proposes that, quote, bones are emblems of death which bear no trace of nature's cannibalism. They are the hard, clean, sanitised remnants of putrefaction, unquote. So to turn from pa to loam, as Hamlet does, is thus to cleanse human death of its meatiness. It is to forget what has been. And the forgetting becomes even more calculated when it is too neatly wrapped up in a rhyme. Imperius Caesar, dead and turned to clay, might stop a hole to keep the wind away. Oh, that the earth which kept such world in awe should patch a wall to expel the water's floor. The shift from prose to perfect couplets, from pa to wit, marks a move from, you might say, flesh to bone. From death, revealing the human as decaying meat, to death, as encountered in religious ritual, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It's notable as well that in Hamlet's biographies of Alexander and Caesar, he has both of them as active agents of the grammar. They stop the holes. They are not passively used to do some stopping. Hamlet's shift of emphasis from flesh to loam can be read as doing important work for him and for his audience. It is an act of calculated forgetting, a moment in which the similarity of human and animal flesh that haunts the play, as it haunts the culture that it existed in, is made invisible. For Perkins, this is an appropriate shift. It takes Hamlet from the focus of our graves as they appear to the bodily eye, to a vision of the human as seen by the eye of faith. It returns man to his special status as the possessor of the angels 
spiritual essence. But the fact of the pa, the inclusion of it in the text, makes that shift incomplete. Indeed, the play seems to move backwards and forwards between seeing with the bodily eye and with the eyes of faith. This is not a single step. The, f the play forgets and remembers, remembers and forgets. As illustration, the fleshy human was present in the graveyard scene even before the smelly encounter with Yorick and before Hamlet turned to contemplate clay. It was there when he asked the question what it, that is in this context, I think, just as profound as to be or not to be. And that is, how long will a man lie in the earth ere he rot? Again, this is a man. This is not a body or a corpse. It's the individual he who is in the earth. And the answer the grave digger gives is, faith, if it be not rotten before I die, as we have many pocky corpses that will scarce hold the laying in, I will last you some eight year or nine year, a tanner will last you nine year. The tanner, the grave digger states, lasts a bit longer because, quote, his hide is so tanned with his trade that he will keep out the water a good while. And the he again marks, as it did with Polonius in Act 4, that the individual continues after death. And it's for this reason that I've paused over Martin's writing about Polonius's body and Borlick discussing Polonius's corpse. What unthought conception of the human and its distinction from animals is being reinforced in such interpretative strategies? What acts of forgetting can we trace when we separate the human body from the human individual. At the end of the play, the anxiety about human status, about our difference from animals persists. Even after Horatio has called on flights of angels to his sing Hamlet to his rest and thus evoke the special status of the human as an immortal earthly being, Fortin Brass enters and speaks of the bodies he sees as quarry. That is a hunting term. And he asks personified death, what feast is toward in thine eternal cell? But this language of edibility is swiftly replaced by the image that closes the play. He says, let four captains bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage, for he was likely, had he been put on, to have proved most royal. The monumentalizing of Hamlet is a cover for the ambiguity of human existence. Like a soldier, likely, had he been put on. Hamlet is not what he is staged to be. He has never been that thing, but he will, he will be celebrated like this because Fortinbras sees with the eye of faith. He believes something would have happened to Hamlet in life, just as he, like Perkins, believes something will have happened to Hamlet in death. The naturalizing of our humanity as existing beyond or perhaps in spite of our flesh has had massive impact on our relationship with animals and with our planet. This has been recognized by environmental thinking for generations. So Lynn White Jr.'s influential essay, The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis, was published in 1967. And in it, he famously argued that, quote, by destroying pagan animism, Christianity made it possible to exploit nature in a mood of indifference to the feelings of natural objects, unquote. So as humans are constructed as subjects in life and in death, all else is commodified. And we are now more than ever recognizing the impact of the conception of our species as transcending the material and as having unlimited rights to use the planet and its inhabitants. It took René Descartes to construct or to calculate, you might say, a philosophy in which the ambiguous closeness of humans and animals enabled by Christian thinking was made unimportant as the human was traced only in reason, in the cogito. What Shakespeare was showing decades before that is that there, were already, there was already discomfort at the connections that drew humans too close to the creatures they were meant to hold dominion over. And knowing that you yourself was edible, were edible was at the core of that discomfort. The thoroughgoing forgetting that followed Descartes can be brilliantly traced in the eco-feminist philosopher Val Plumwood's discussion of her near fatal encounter with a wild animal in 1985. So this is a quote from Val Plumwood. It is not a minor or inessential feature of our human existence that we are food, juicy, nourishing bodies. 
Yet as I looked into the eye of the crocodile, I realized that my planning for this journey upriver had given insufficient attention to this important aspect of human life, to my own vulnerability as an edible animal being. Of course, in some very remote and abstract way, I knew it happened. I knew that humans were animals and were sometimes very rarely eaten like other animals. I knew I was food for crocodiles, that my body like theirs was, theirs was made of meat. But then again, in some very important way, I did not know, and I absolutely rejected it. For Plumwood, as for Hamlet the play, I think, the knowledge of human fleshiness is there, but is rejected. The fact of our edibility is calculatedly forgotten and human exceptionalism is allowed to reign supreme. She wrote of this moment that you, quote, gasp in disbelief that some powerful creature can ignore your special status and try to eat you, unquote. Who we are or who we have been naturalized to see ourselves as being is distinct, superior, better. We have almost forgotten, almost, our other self. But that other self comes back to catch us out, whether in the form of an animal who views us as food or in our own attempts to forget that potential. So when Laertes says of Ophelia, lay her in the earth and from her fair, unpolluted flesh may violets spring, he is claiming her immortal purity in the face of institutional religion's rejection of her. But he is also, albeit accidentally, recognizing her value as fertilizer. This humiliation of the human plays a crucial role in the terrors that Hamlet presents, terrors that are still horrifying today. Remembering this asks us to recall that the separation of humans from animals that has been naturalized so destructively is an act of faith. But there is, to return to Perkins, another true indeed being that is human who we might do well to focus on a little more. Thank you.